Hello and welcome to our first video on uh, Unit 4 Area of Study 2 of VCE Media, Agency and Control in and of the Media. Uh, that's the full title of this area of study. Um, commonly we'll just call it Agency and Control, um, but this idea of in and of the media uh, is important and uh, we will get to that a little later on. So key concepts to consider in this area of study, um, the things that we'll be looking at are the relationship between media institutions and their audiences, uh, past and present theories about um, the power of the media to influence audiences, as well as the power of audiences to influence the media. Uh, we'll be looking at ways in which governments attempt to control the media um, or regulate the relationship between the media and uh, audiences. Um, we'll be specifically looking in this unit as um, we progress the recent changes in the way that the media operates. Um, when I say recent, um, I'm more talking about the last um, 15 years. Um, that is recent, of course, in the history of um, media operation and might not feel so recent um, to you guys as we're studying this. We'll also be looking at um, the effects that an increasingly global and social media has in comparison to some more traditional uh, forms of media. And finally, we'll be diving into some of the, the sticky ethical and legal issues um, that pervade the media today. Now, these dot points are um, taken and adapted from the actual VCE study design as our um, key knowledge and key skills. Um, it is important, though, that uh, you do understand what the actual key knowledge is and the wording of the VCE study design, because this is an interpretation of that study study design. To make it a little bit easier though, um, we're basically going to break things into four separate topics. Um, all of those key knowledge and key skills, um, they do have relationships with one another. Um, it, it is a little bit hard to um, silo and isolate each of these, um, but we'll essentially be breaking things up into looking at the dynamic relationship between the media and the audience. And that is what we'll be diving into later in this video. We'll be looking at um, the influence of both the media media and audiences, um, the regulation of the media and legal and ethical issues in the contemporary or current media landscape. So let's dive into this idea of the dynamic relationship between the media and audience. So the relationship between the media and audiences is what we consider dynamic. That word is important to understand. The relationship is dynamic, which just means that it is constantly changing. It is in a constant state of flux or flow. Um, and it's more and more difficult to define these days as the line between uh, media and audience is more blurred than ever. And when we think about the history of the media, we can see that the media audience relationship has radically changed over time. When we can see here um, a family sitting around uh, a radio and tuning in at an exact time and moment to listen to a program compared to an individual here engaging in some virtual reality. When we think about these two interactions with the media, we can see that this relationship between um, how audiences consume and engage with the media um, has changed significantly. Or has it? Um, we can see in these two images, individuals uh, reading um, as they stand on the street in 1916, um, over 100 years ago, and in 2016. Has that relationship actually changed or have we just replaced uh, the newspaper with the iPhone? And these are some of the questions that we will be uh, wrestling with in this unit. So a real key understanding is that there is no definitive answer. Unfortunately, uh, in VCE media, there is no absolute answer. Media communication is entirely theoretical. These theories are contentious, they're constantly debated as different studies prove and then disprove certain claims about who has agency and control, the media or the audience. For every example that you can point to to say that a person playing video games has made them more violent, there is 
a, a study that points to no the video games actually help somebody um, or don't have any impact on them whatsoever so it's really important that when you are writing about the relationship between the media and the audience that you understand that there is no one true answer and so therefore it's important that you're not using phrases like this proves that dot 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 and so what we'll be covering in this video today i really want you to understand the basics in terms of this relationship between media and audience and so when we think of the basics we think of the the who what when why how um, and i've added to this the effect so um, who's the relationship between um, what is the focus that defines these relationships um, when did this sort of change supposedly occur that we're talking about? Um, why have things changed? Um, and how have they changed? And then finally, you know, what is the impact or what is the effect um, of this changing relationship on the individuals involved? So it might help you um, as you're watching through this video to answer these questions as we go. Firstly, who's involved? Um, we talk about uh, stakeholders in the media. And stakeholder is just a term that we give to somebody who has an interest or is engaged with something, in this case, the media. When we're talking about the media relationships, we're focused on three main stakeholders. Um, the media institutions themselves, so the production uh, houses and uh, distributors. Um, we look at individuals, and when we talk about individuals, we mainly mean audiences. And finally, we look at the governments. And so if we think about the relationship between these stakeholders, think of it almost as a triangle where the media is in the middle and these three parties are trying to wrestle um, with each other to gain more agency and control of that media. So we have the institutions who actually um, produce and distribute the media, we have the audiences who try to uh, understand and seek media that appeals to them. And we have the governments who are a little bit wary of the media and want to make sure that um, the relationship between institutions and individuals is a healthy one. So governments try to butt in from now and then. And so um, each group therefore has a relationship with the other two. All three want to have control of the media and all three want to limit the agency of the other two. And so when we're talking about these things, um, it's important to understand, well, okay, what does actually agency and control mean? So what defines these relationships? Well, agency and control for us, we can just assume that it means power in the media. There are definitive terms for each, but when you combine agency and control, the more of the two that you have, the more overall power you gain over um, the other two stakeholders. So tensions exist between audiences, governments, and media institutions as the three wrestle for power by trying to increase their own control and their own agency and limit those of others. So when we're talking about agency in media, we're talking about the capacity for in individuals or institutions to act independently and make free choices. If you are said to have agency, you are making decisions for yourself without being influenced by anybody else and without necessarily having an impact on anybody else. Whereas control is um, the reverse side of that coin. It refers to the ability to influence or direct the behavior or, and choices of others. A really simple example when I think about agency and control, um, I think about the ability to go to the bathroom. And sorry, I'm painting this sort of picture in your heads, but if you think when uh, you as a high school student, when you're at home, you have agency as to when you choose to go to the bathroom or not. Um, you have the absolute ability to uh, make that free choice to get up, stop whatever you're doing and go and use the bathroom. Weirdly, in a school situation, that's a little bit different. And it depends on the teacher that you've got, but um, for the most part in a classroom situation, the teacher has control 
over whether you use the bathroom or not. You actually have to ask permission, which feels really weird um, when it's something that is just impacting only you. But thinking about the media, and uh, it might be a good exercise to copy and paste this table um, and create your own where you think about what are the examples when you as an audience member have agency and control over the media and when the media has some agency and some control over you. Some really simple examples that I can think of um, for media agency or their free choice, their independent choice. Um, a newspaper can decide what story to put on the front page. That's their free choice. They can decide out of all of the news events from um, the previous day, what will be front and center on page one. The media also has some control. They can schedule TV programs at a certain time and day. And so this has control over me as an audience because if I want to watch um, the MasterChef elimination, I know I have to be sitting in front of my TV at 7.30 on the Sunday. Now, yes, I can use catch up TV a little bit later, um, but I certainly can't access that before. So this has some control over my viewing habits. Thinking about the reverse situation, what do I have as a free choice as an audience member? Well, if I'm watching something on Netflix, I can pause. I can pause and use that agency to go to the bathroom if I choose, um, or put some popcorn in the microwave, um, or fill up my drink. Um, I have that choice. It does not affect Netflix. Um, it is only affecting me. Um, so that is a free choice, an independent choice that I can choose. But I can also have some control over the media. Um, I can make a comment on um, or even report a post on TikTok or Instagram or any other social media account. And that is going to have an influence over um, the person who put up that post in the first time, depending on whether that comment is um, glowing and positive, um, whether that comment is negative, or if my reporting of it uh, takes that post down for a short or extended period of time. Now, of course, when we are talking about agency and control, we typically talk about these two things together, even though they are separate concepts, because um, some of these things can't live without the other. So as an example, um, by a newspaper choosing to put a certain story on the front page, that might influence or control my opinion as an audience member to think what is the most important thing happening in the world today. In a similar way, um, Channel 10 scheduling MasterChef, well, that is obviously a free choice that they make and it just happens to have an influence over me. And the reverse can be said. Um, by me pausing that movie on Netflix, perhaps I don't come back to it. And if I don't come back to it and it's just stopped there forever, maybe that feeds into Netflix's uh, algorithm about my tastes as a user. And so that actually has a control or an influence over what they suggest to me next time I come to Netflix. So we can see here when we talk about agency and control, they're two separate concepts and we can point to things in separate ways and we should, but they do have a relationship together. Now, something that you may have noticed when I have pointed out these examples is these two up here where the media is said to have some agency and control, they tend to be um, the types of media that are a little bit older whereas these two tend to be more current or contemporary media forms. Um, and that's, that's quite on purpose because there has been said to have an increase in audience agency and control um, in the more contemporary media. So it's important to understand when this change in relationship is said to occur. And we can essentially split the media into two different categories or two different time periods. We have traditional media in what was called the broadcast era. And that includes things like uh, newspapers, magazines, billboards, so print media, as well as um, TV, radio, and film. Um, they tend to be categorized by very little audience agency. 
whereas the contemporary media refers to all those um, invented and used after the arrival of what we refer to as Web 2.0 in 2005. Um, Web 2.0 is essentially a, a period of time where the internet got um, fast enough to stream video on demand. And so streaming services, social media, um, and online gaming really took off after 2005. And audiences in this period of time are said to have had gained more agency and actively participate in and with the media. Of course, audiences did um, interact and, and participate with the media before 2005. Um, video games is a good example of that audience interaction and agency and perhaps control too. Um, and so these periods, while we do break them up and separate them, it is a bit of a continuum. It is a bit of a spectrum where things have changed um, gradually over time, but we can recognize 2005 as a key moment in this period. Again, as these three stakeholders wrestle for more agency and control, the landscape does continue to evolve. Things continue to change. It is not just a case of this is what happened before 2005 and this is what it's like after 2005. Things are always moving, always progressing, always evolving. And so why have things changed? Um, these are the conditions that, that have forced this flip um, in relationships. So I mentioned before, the main thing is technology. So high speed internet allowed for the streaming of video in combination with video compression being of such a high quality that they could squeeze down or compress a video file to such a small size that it could travel um, easily across the internet, but also not lose as much quality when it was reopened and watched. The other thing that happened as far as technology is the increase in personal devices. The iPhone was first released in 2008, the iPad two years after. This meant that the media became accessible anywhere, anytime. Audiences no longer had to sit in front of the TV to watch a television program they could pull out their phone from their pocket and watch it then and there. Something that to us today is second nature, but in 2008 was revolutionary. The idea of the internet being high speed also meant that the traditional media distribution regions, so nations, states, cities, um, were dismantled. Previously, a film that needed to be screened in cinemas would actually be screened in America first for a couple of months. And then when people were no longer going to the cinemas, they took the film reels and then sent it across to Australia for us to watch here. And so that idea of a globalization of the internet meant that Australian audiences, we wanted things at the same time as everybody else. And finally, the governments who are typically slow to make laws have not been able to keep up with the progress of technology. And this is why we do find that things are constantly evolving. We can see that now as a number of governments are only just starting to act against the social media giants and start to put in some regulations around what they do. And this is one of the more important things. How have things actually changed for these three stakeholders? Well, if we think about audiences, traditionally they had very little agency to interact and respond to media messages. Basically, audiences could just consume. And now the role of the audience has undergone a significant change. We play a controlling role in this media landscape. Not only do we have more agency to decide what we want to watch, when we want to watch, and how we want to watch it, we are also participating in the media by creating things ourselves, commenting, and creating change. The institutions traditionally, um, agency and control was limited to a few powerful media outlets and institutions. Um, in America, they talk about the big five Hollywood studios in the golden age of Hollywood. Um, but we can also think about things like newspapers in Melbourne. We have the choice between the Herald Sun and the Age. If we think about TV networks in Australia, in the past, we had the choice between ABC SBS 7, 9, and 10. 
And when we think about the media landscape today, some argue that this type of power has reduced with the rise of audience agency. While others say that uh, the dominance of Facebook and Google uh, concentrate the power of the media even further. And so governments, when we think about how governments use the media, um, they've always um, manipulated the media to share their own ideas um, and dominant ideology. They use the media to communicate with uh, citizens um, and they also attempt to control the media to protect vulnerable audiences. Now with the rise of globalized media networks, um, local, national or state level governments have struggled to maintain the same ways and the same levels of control that they previously enjoyed. It is difficult for the Australian government to try to police something like Facebook, an American global company. The details of these relationships we will go into a little bit further and look at some specific examples, but this is just a summary of how things have changed for each of these three different stakeholders in the media. Finally, um, we'd like to look at the effect. And often when we're talking about the relationship between media and audience, we tend to talk about, okay, what's the impact? What's the effect? So this change between the broadcast and the post-broadcast era um, has resulted in significant changes in the way that audiences um, behave and engage with the media. If we think about the broadcast era, um, consumption was communal. We can see this um, image of the family sitting around the radio. Um, you would join together around the one device in the household, or you would come together to the cinema. Therefore, the programming of the broadcast era tended to be broad. Um, it tended to be based on geographic location and to appeal to as much people in that location as possible. The geographic location um, is actually important because newspapers can only travel a certain distance before the news becomes irrelevant. Radio and television signals would only be able to be broadcast a certain distance before the signal was lost. In the broadcast era, we also have what we talk about being passive consumption. Audiences would simply sit and read sit and watch, sit and listen to the media, they would have very little interaction, very little engagement with it other than just passive, so sitting there um, and consuming it. And the time and mode of consumption was something that was controlled by the media distributors themselves. Um, as we've said before, if you wanted to watch a particular show, you had to wait for that um, day and time to watch it. And if you had another commitment on, uh, then you would just have to wait until the media distributor uh, decided to show a re-screening of that particular program. And finally, the role of the audience in the broadcast era was solely to consume. They just watched. They had very, very little ability to engage with and respond to the media itself. Compare all this to what we have today, the post-broadcast era. Here, consumption is individual. We can see in this photo uh, below where we've got the family who are sitting around together, but they're sitting around together on their own individual devices. And because of that, unlike the broadcast era, um, programming tends to be targeted to niche audiences. So very specific audiences based on their interest rather than location. If we think about that term broadcast, um, in the past, programs were made like casting a net broadly. You try to catch as many fish as possible um, as a media producer by casting that broad net, by having something that appeals to the majority. Whereas now, um, content is made like um, fishing on the line and reel where we're targeting specific audience members because that's who we want to appeal to. Consumption these days is an active process. We click and scroll, we swipe and comment, um, we play games, we interact, um, we use voice control, we use um, video or game controllers to actually manipulate the situation. Um, we produce our own things. So it is an active process. It is no longer just sitting and absorbing in a passive way. 
We as audiences also have agency in the conditions of consumption. We can watch things when we want, where we want, how we want, on what device we want. And finally, our role as an audience is still to consume, but now it is also to contribute to augment or change and create media ourselves. Audiences today as being a participatory audience. We're involved, we participate with the media, we don't just consume it. And now the flip side, thinking about what has changed for media institutions and perhaps what hasn't. Well, in the broadcast era, um, the media themselves would produce and distribute commercial content themselves. They would broadcast to general audiences, as we've said, casting that net far and wide. The media in the broadcast era had some limitations placed upon them by the government in terms of regulation. They were held accountable by strict laws. And in the broadcast era, the media was only controlled by a few major institutions. They're the handful of TV networks that I mentioned before, or the big five Hollywood studios. Compare this to what we experience in contemporary media in the post-broadcast era. Well, as media institutions, they do still produce some things, but now they primarily distribute content. Instagram does not produce their own content. They simply distribute the content of others. Some of this is individual user generated and some of these is commercially generated. In the post-broadcast era, institutions manage and sustain social networks. They are involved with individual users. If you as an individual post something that they don't like, they would get involved with that. Whereas as an audience member in the past, Broadcasters tended to just care about what the majority was doing. Um, are they getting hundreds of thousands of viewers or not? You as an individual didn't make a difference. And contemporary media like social media institutions um, have experienced very little regulation from governments. However, over the past probably five years, um, this has started to change and we can see is evolving and increasingly changing today where more governments are trying to put more conditions and regulations upon the social media giants. And finally, something that is actually not a change is for the majority, the contemporary media landscape is still controlled by a few major institutions. The biggest two is of course, Google and Facebook. And so hopefully this video has given you a bit of an insight into the, the who, what, when, how, um, and the effects of the changes in the media landscape. It is important to know some of these, but we will dive into some specific examples that you can um, use and uh, apply this understanding to. Um, so hopefully you can catch that video soon. Thanks for watching.